This is The Enragé, a show where we take a deeper dive into written works published at the Center for a Stateless Society. Join us as we give voice to the ideas challenging the vain phantoms that haunt our social reality and stand in the way of total liberation. For more information, visit c4ss.org. And to support this show or any of the other projects happening at the center, please visit patreon.com slash c4ss.org. Thank you for listening. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the 24th installment of The All Rangé. This is your host, Eric Fleischman. It's been a month or two since we did an episode thanks to some field work and spring farm prep on my part. But we're back. Today we'll be joined by H.B. Dylan Williams IV to discuss their article, Molotov Pill Bottle, Radical Answers to Failed Capitalist Healthcare. H.B. Dylan Williams IV, they, he, is a Mexican indigenous Irish genderqueer anti-fascist anarchist rapper, father of three, activist, magic player, and avid fan of dolphin music. Dylan entered the activist world with Abolish Ice Denver in 2018. In 2019, they worked with the Caravan Support Network that came out of the national organizing Abolish Ice Groups, traveling to Tijuana, Mexico to help uh, gain organizing experience as well as firsthand knowledge of the border crisis, which has recently reached another high point under the Biden administration. They continued migration activism in Phoenix after that and began working for Medicare, which ultimately prompted this article. Through this time, he has developed his philosophy incorporating insights from organizing, still a student of modern monetary theory and agorism with a lot of different sympathies. Find their Instagram at rage.incarnate. Do you prefer HB or Dylan? Oh, I I go by Dylan. That's just because I always knew growing up that having some initials before the rest of your name was the best author name you could have. And so uh, that was a carefully constructed identity right there. I love that. I actually love that. Um, (laughs) That's very iconic. So Dylan, um, how are you doing? I'm doing really well lately. Um, Been enjoying time with my family. Uh, The weather is getting nicer. And, uh, you know, just seeing uh, what's going on in the world. Yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful time of year. Yeah. But, um, so what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about your article, (laughs) Molotov pill bottle, radical answers to failed capitalist healthcare center for stateless society. Um, why don't you give the audience a brief summary of this piece and why you chose to write it? Oh yeah. So there was this bill that, um, at some point seemed like it was going to include a lot of positive changes for healthcare, for Medicare, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It was the build back better. Um, Under the Biden administration, his big push, the bill he wanted to uh, have some recognition for, um, it just didn't end up succeeding. Uh, I was watching it closely for a long time. It was going to include some expansions to Medicare that in my time working at Medicare, um, seemed necessary. And I should add here, just so I don't ever get in any trouble, these are not the views of my employer, nor of Medicare, mm. because why would any corporation be an anarchist? <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, since I work for the federal subcontractor for Medicare, and I get to take calls uh, every day for people who call 100 Medicare, I have a unique perspective of knowing exactly what it is that people, a lot of them seniors, are dealing with on a day-to-day basis. And so one of the issues is that when you have Medicare, there's really two systems. One is a not-for-profit system that doesn't include everything. And that means the other half is a for-profit system that has all the stuff that you're going to end up needing to switch to it for at some point dental, vision, and hearing. When people get older, those three things stop working as well, along with a lot of other things. And so it's just really not fair that you have to choose between having a plan that fully covers you 
uh, with a supplemental on your original Medicare, or you go for the for-profit system that doesn't fully cover you, has a very limited network, they get to decide if they're approving procedures or not. Um, And so it's really challenging for a lot of old folks to make the decisions and navigate these bureaucratic systems that are really unclear, especially in your older age when it can be a little hard to think of things as complex as insurance and understand everything that's going on. Um, So it's really a vulnerable population, uh, uniquely vulnerable. They're not able to become less vulnerable um, by their own agency. And so the fact that they get stuck picking between a plan that might cover their glasses but doesn't cover their dentures, or it might cover their glasses and their dentures, but not their prescriptions as well, and they have to pay a lot more money than they would have on the other system, except they wouldn't have got the glasses and the dentures. So it's just a terrible trade-off that we force our own parents and grandparents to live with. And it's so ridiculously inhumane when you put it that way, that you're doing it to your own family members once they get too old to keep contributing money into the economy. Uh, They get taken advantage of. It's really unfair. And so it just seemed like this change that Build Back Better was proposing was going to be really politically viable. We always hear that AARP is supposedly a powerful political lobby, but it can't seem to get better health care for seniors. Hmm. That's really interesting you're bringing that up. I actually did a little bit of field work um, in the Northeast around working with um, elders and elder care. I totally hear what you're saying with this sort of, it's, you know, uh, screwed one way, screwed the other way. Like, it's a really difficult system to navigate. I'm curious a little bit about um, your thought on Because you mentioned Biden's Build uh, Back Better plan in your article and the way it might affect um, the systems that already exist. Do you want to – I'm curious what your thoughts on the uh, Build Better Back plan was. So, um, you know, as an anarchist, it's difficult to say that you support uh, a piece of status legislation that is going to intervene in the economy in ways that – uh, certainly will have negative impacts, even though the intention is positive. And, and you can give them that there will be some positive impacts too. It's just uh, how are they going to achieve it? And, and um, the fact that we know they won't be accountable for the negative consequences. That's really the, the other thing. I think that's one of the, the biggest strengths of the anarchist perspective is not that we don't want improvement. It's that we know that they won't take any responsibility for the mistakes mm-hmm. they make. So, so that's really a, a large part of our opposition. Um, when it comes to my support of the Build Back Better legislation, I was really hoping that these seniors were going to get um, dental vision and hearing included into the mainstream original Medicare Um, And that specifically is because under the original Medicare, you can have a supplemental, meaning that the portion of your covered services Medicare doesn't pay for, your supplemental pays for instead of you. You can choose not to have one. Many people do. But it really just helps you uh, manage your bills, especially because when you're older, you're typically on a fixed income. And so I was really hoping that they would get that included dental vision and hearing in original. That way your supplemental could help pick up that remaining portion and people could get their dentures, their hearing aids, uh, their glasses, whatever it is they might need um, in regard to those things fully covered. And that doesn't mean they're not paying something. So for everyone who says, oh, they just want it for free. No, they're still paying. It's just that it's a set price since they're on a set income. It makes sense, I think, um, since they can't they can't handle the fluctuating um, prices the way that other people who are still working age might be more able to. Um, so it just seemed like a really common sense, positive improvement on a system that's already so big, so bulky, um, so in need of improvement. And so far beyond the political will to be changed, people really don't want to undo anything when it comes to Medicare. In fact, the history of it, um, it started out just parts A and B, your hospital and your medical, then they added on the prescriptions. 
And then they created the Advantage system to add those dental vision and hearing services. So it's really just been one giant chunk of law book on top of another one <laughs> over the decades. And, um, and the result is not just a system people can't navigate, but it still has all these gaps. And so I thought they were going to help fill in some gaps, and I wanted to see that happen. The thing that ended up happening was they negotiated away almost everything other than negotiated prescription drug prices, which is something that the Veterans Affairs um, has had for for some time now. So it's not that it was out of the question. It was actually a really easy thing for them to just add that to Medicare too. Um, so in the end, they got something done, hmm. but um, there was just so much more on the table. And that is really what led me to say, okay, if we can't, um, if we can't even expect uh, the smallest improvements out of the government that should have been politically supported across the board, you know, there's old people in both parties. There's old people who, who you know, like every politician has parents who, if they're not on Medicare, they, you know, someone in their family and is going to be um, someday. Yeah, it really does affect everybody. And so it's just ridiculous that there was no will to change it. And so I said, okay, well, this thing has been addressed before. What do these radical groups um, have to offer in terms of their, uh, their historical contribution? What can we learn from them? What can we do? And then once I started looking into all of that, then it became clear that there are some specific... Uh, strategies that really depend, you know, r regardless of the context, uh, we can look at these and define them as different strategies. And that could be useful so that no matter what context you're in, there might be a tool available that mm -hmm. suits your needs. And what are, what are these groups? Uh, like, like, like you mentioned in your article, Black Panther Party, Young Patriots, Early Jewish Communities, um, I'm interested to hear, like, uh, when you say these groups, what do you specifically? Oh, yeah. So, so the Black Panthers were one of the biggest and most influential, and that's because they had a model of revolutionary service. Mm -hmm. They believed that there were things that needed to be done before the revolution happened. And that put a sense of urgency that other groups didn't seem to have. They had a um, community-centric uh, praxis. Mm -hmm. So they went to the community and said, what do you want? What do you need? They didn't impose an agenda. Mm -hmm. um, that's also something the young lords did. They're a Puerto Rican group. Yep. Um, and while they're, um, and I think, I think it's safe to say they're a lot less known than the Black Panthers are. Yeah. They did a lot of similar things. Um, arguably, they were more intersectional, and especially at a time when Black feminism was in its earliest stages, uh, there was not the language of intersectionality. Um, and so these groups were really building it, mm -hmm. not just from the ground up in terms of activism, but they were building the ideology from the ground up. And they were themselves from these communities. So there was no like weird outside leftist white savior we're coming to help you and feel good about it type thing it was we're all helping ourselves the black panthers were a mutual self-defense organization that started in oakland in the in the 60s in response to police brutality that was rampant uh, at a time when when the cameras and and tv didn't show that it was still so well known because of how rampant it was um and the young lords similarly were actually a gang in Chicago, and they radicalized politically because of police brutality and different things that would go on. Um, and so there was a, uh, a real change that was happening at the end of the 60s with the start of what we call the New Left. And that's cool to people who know the history of C4SS mm -hmm. because the New Left is something that started the Alliance of the Libertarian Left. And, uh, well, I should say that movement yeah. influenced the start of it. And that organization eventually morphed uh, into C4SS, if I understand correctly. Um, 
there's no official, and so, there's no official continuity, but it's definitely inspired, right, right. inspired by. Yeah, there's exactly. Yeah, it was the same bunch of folks right in the same ideas and stuff. Um and so so to me that's really cool that that's a, a legacy that um is definitely not taught in school that all these groups took it upon themselves. And even though they weren't anarchists, I think they had a very anarchist praxis. They were Marxist, but they disagreed with Marx about the lumpen proletariat. They believed that that was the most revolutionary uh, potential, the, the greatest, the group with the greatest revolutionary potential in society because it was the least invested in capitalism. That's all my, um, I, I absolutely adore the theoretical writing of Huey Newton because of the way that he challenges Marx on so many things and comes to a conclusion that is so close to like anarchism with his like communalism and yeah. communalism. Um, so I, I, and, uh, yeah, continue. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. There was just one group I didn't want to leave out oh, here. Please. Um, who was a really big part of that initial, um, what we call the rainbow coalition where yeah. the Panthers and the Lords in Chicago, even though the Panthers started in Oakland, they moved uh, and spread out mm -hmm. to a lot of cities and they were in Chicago. The young Lords, I believe started in Chicago. And then from my understanding, uh, members of the young Lords gang in New York heard about this radicalization. Um, they had not initially all been interested but then when the police brutality continued, uh, I believe there was a, an especially heinous event that really triggered it. Um, the group said, okay, we're going to start looking into all this stuff. And, and so it's, it's interesting to me that it was actually the Lumpen proletariat who became these active groups and, um, and took their community on their backs. And so then the next group that I didn't mention yet is the Young Patriots. Yeah. And they were Appalachian whites who moved down from the mountains into Chicago. And because they were so ethnically distinct, they had different dress, uh, different accents. Um, so they were culturally distinct. And they actually understood themselves as something of similar to a nation, in a way. Um, not in an explicitly white supremacist sense, but there were um, elements that, were definitely nationalistic and they had the Confederate flag as part of their symbolism. Mm -hmm. And so they organized in Chicago and they really were dealing with the police brutality uh, as well. And so one of the things that Fred Hampton did in Chicago was go to these different groups and the Panthers, there's even video of this on, on YouTube you can find where the Panthers came in and talked to the Patriots and there was a, tension over the flag and yeah. um i think i've seen ultimately the patriots i'm sorry go ahead no i think i've seen this yeah but continue yeah and ultimately um the the patriots and the panthers had a lot of common ground uh, about the needs of their community they were both poor mistreated by the police and in need of a lot of basic things especially health care and so that was something that they could organize around. And the Panthers um, accepted at, at some point early, not, not immediately, but at some point early on in the relationship, accepted that the Patriots were using the Confederate flag as a symbol of national unity that represented their distinctness hmm. from the northern Chicago culture that they were now in and felt oppressed by. And so they accepted their use of the flag. And interestingly enough, later, the Patriots got rid of the flag mm -hmm. and said, we understand how it looks. Uh, we don't stand behind those values. And we stand with um, our br uh, black and brown brothers and sisters. And they actually said, I believe I'm paraphrasing, but they said the South will rise again, this time in solidarity with black and brown people. That's cool. That's interesting. I didn't so, know about so that's, that part. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the reason we're bringing up Black Panther Party, Young Patriots, Young Lords, is because you've outlined in your article these six, these six distinct strategies for accessing healthcare. And the first one is the creation of alternative institutions. You want to talk a little bit about the sort of alternative institutions that those groups 
like initiated, especially in the realm of healthcare. Absolutely, and and I'm glad that you uh, you brought that up because the Panthers taught the the young lords and the patriots as well as other groups i'm leaving out i forget the name of an asian group that they organized with as well and um so the panthers went into the hospitals and the universities and they made relationships with doctors and medical students who were going to be doctors soon and nurses um all types of medical staff and they were able to use those relationships to build institutions, meaning that they found spaces that they could use, whether it was a doctor's office who was willing to contribute some time at some point in their schedule, or whether it was someone else who had a a clean space, they were able to set up clinics using the space and the staff that they made relationships with. Um, They were able to fundraise, and because they were doing so much work in the community, feeding people. Um, They created different campaigns. Uh, Sickle cell was not an issue that was very well known at the time. Mm -hmm. And because it was uniquely affecting Black people so much in this country, that was something that they were very able to bring to the public awareness. Um, And they also did different screenings for a lot of other conditions as well. So they were really going to people, meeting people where they were going to their homes, helping drive them to visits to the doctor, um, helping do child care for those people while they went uh, to the doctor. So they made it possible to access health care. Mm. They brought the health care to the community, um, and they taught the other groups how to do that. So that's how they specifically built alternative institutions. Now, there's more ways than that, of course. And later, I'll touch on some other groups mm. that are doing work now um, that we can look at. But there's, there's definitely, I think, a very um, observable template of you start off networking, you find out what people need, you make sure it's what they want. That way you have their support. Any actions you take, any, any resistance you face, you have their support. Mm. Then you're able to build further relationships because now when you go to all those other doctors and medical students and whoever and you're saying hey i have this idea something i want to do you you can say oh and all these people i talk to in the community want this need this we can help them so you're making it real yeah absolutely and so they would uh, set up clinics under themselves which it, it leads into the, the your second example of you know ac- the strategies for accessing healthcare, which is the expropriation right. and repurposing of needed equipment. Is that did the Black Panthers and um, uh, Young Lords utilize that to build their own? So the Young Lords uh, did utilize that strategy. I don't know of any specific stories in my research of the Panthers expropriating equipment, but I do know specifically that the Young Lords, um, they did, they did um, that for a tuberculosis screening van that would go through different neighborhoods in New York City, but it would always avoid the Puerto Rican ones. And so they noticed this. Everyone who needed those screenings noticed this. Mm -hmm. And so they actually spoke to the people who drove that van. So even though they were expropriating the equipment, it it wasn't against the voluntary consent. It wasn't, they didn't kidnap the people in the van to do that. (laughs) Um, So I think that's a good libertarian distinction worth mentioning that they actually cared about the agency of the workers in the van. They didn't Mm -hmm. think it was okay to violate that. Um, And so they had them bring the van to their neighborhood and they had already told the community they were going to do this at a certain day and time. So they had a line of people waiting and the newspapers wrote about this. Mm -hmm. This became well known that even though the media tried to smear the action of the young lords. There was no removing the fact that there was a lot of people waiting for those screenings when they got there. Mm-hmm. And that obviously showed even, even white people could see that's, that's just plain, you know, uh, discrimination. Yeah. And what do you mean by expropriation specifically? It's a popular topic in anarchist circles, what that means. 
Right. So expropriation can mean stealing. It can mean borrowing against the will of the owner for a period of time. Uh, and I think that's what the young lords did. Um, it is my understanding that the van and its workers returned everything, the equipment, and then the change was made that the ambulance now took a route into the Puerto Rican community. Mm. Um, so that was the long-term victory of that one-time action that was um, something that they could move forward with. Yeah. Um, in terms of, so I'm sorry, to, I, I didn't exactly fully answer, like, what does expropriation mean? So, so in terms of the stealing, it can mean stealing equipment and um, while... I know C4SS is an officially legally sanctioned nonprofit that cannot advocate any illegal activities at any time. And that is not what I am doing. We mm -hmm. are discussing the economics of what happens when equipment is expropriated. And when that happens, you completely avoid the acquisition cost of that equipment, which can be really high. Um, in many cases, you may not be able to uh, to acquire it because there might be laws about where that equipment has to be when it's delivered. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but um, that, that seems like a reasonable guess. Hmm. Uh, and so in any case, um, if you can avoid that acquisition cost, then you've dramatically decreased the cost of access that people really face when they go to get that care. Now, if you have an x-ray machine, I mean, I don't know how you'd steal a whole x-ray machine. I think those things are pretty big. Yeah. But um, <laughs> if you had a whole one, then you could give the x-rays away. Or you could just charge the, the the fee associated with the time that the tech takes so that you're compensating the worker. Um, but you would be able to avoid the other fees. And um, this point about the economics of expropriation bringing the acquisition cost to zero is something we will return to later just so people know <laughs> okay um and so you know moving on that was number two so number one is creation of alternative institutions number two is expropriation and repurposing of needed equipment number three is Demanding more of existing institutions via occupation. Occupation is also a hot topic word in anarchist circles. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, yes. And we're going to stay with the young lords here because there were multiple occupations they did. One was of a church that really inspired their use of the tactic further when they succeeded. And they had also pre-discussed the occupation with the pastor at the church. And so there was, there was a lot of interesting tactics they use. So they occupied Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, which was at the time known as the butcher shop. People would go in there and come out worse. Um, and it was, of course, you know, the hospital in the Puerto Rican part of town. So it was underfunded, uh, understaffed. And so the outcomes of medical procedures there were dramatically worse. Um, and there was, of course, another traumatizing, triggering event of somebody dying uh, a needless death mm -hmm. that, that people decided they were going to occupy the hospital. Now, previous to the Young Lords occupation, the Health Revolutionary Unity Movement, um, a group of hospital workers had already done their own um, activism, and I believe it was a strike, if I'm not mistaken now. And so they had been pushing back against the low quality and standard of care there. And so the Young Lords discussed their plans with them. So the whole staff, or at least a significant portion of the staff, was on board with this occupation. So the Young Lords were going to be going in armed, making demands, and the staff was not going to be resisting. That was already uh, a part of it. The staff was on was wanting this. Was totally in alignment with their values. So then it was just going to be the patients who were a question. And if the patients knew the reputation of the hospital because they're in, they live there, then they probably were going to support it too. So they did this occupation. Um, the police were outside. It lasted um, was it six hours? It was it was it was less than a day. And what's really cool is in that time, they made all these demands about um, a 
community-based uh, review board that you could hold the hospital accountable to. Um, there were a couple of different things about the rights they wanted to guarantee, but one thing they specifically created was a patient's bill of rights. And we now have in law a patient's bill of rights mm. because the young Lords fought for that on that day. Wow. They wrote it down. They said patients are entitled to these set things in their care. And then when the police started cracking down and wanted to come in and clean them all out, they put on the lab coats because the staff was Puerto Rican too. So the young lords dressed up like the doctors and the nurses. And when the police said, okay, everyone who's not a young lord, come out of the building, they all went out of the building. Wow. And then they escaped. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a heist thing. Yeah, it's literally the original heist. And it was for the coolest reasons. Um, healthcare. And so, yeah. And, and we all know that movie John Q, where Denzel goes in and holds up the hospital and is like, someone's getting my kid a heart transplant or whatever it is. Mm. And you're thinking like, Denzel, what's the odds that there's a little tiny heart waiting for your kid anyway? <laughs> I'm on your side, but. Yeah, that was oh, how are you going to do oddly it? Oddly specific <laughs> motivation. Yeah, yeah, and, and so, um, so I'm probably leaving out a whole bunch of things that I wanted to include, but you know, I can't touch everything. So, so yeah, the young lords used occupation to demand better standards of care, and even though the hospital still needs work to this day. Um, that was a dramatic improvement. And the Patient Bill of Rights is a long-standing victory we all enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that's really something that they should, really should teach that in school. Yeah, for sure. So we talked a little bit about, about um, you know, creation of institutions, demanding more of existing institutions. Um, let's lean into economics again. Your fourth one your fourth ac uh, strategy for accessing healthcare is free or at cost production and or distribution of needed medicine, supplies, and equipment without regard to copyright. I love to hear your thoughts on the role that copyright plays in the current healthcare crisis. And then also how groups like Four Thieves Vinegar, who um, I think are fucking cool as hell, are working to circumvent it. Absolutely. So copyright is a, a version of, of fencing off the, uh, the thing that people want to get to. So capitalism, rather than expanding people's access and driving costs down and improving the quality of what people want, they deny access to increase the costs and lower the quality in a monopolistic fashion. And specifically, that's the dynamics that are happening is monopolism. Mm -hmm. um, and so... IP is just a capitalist defense of monopolism. Now, there's people who might believe that because capitalism is uh, a system that works the way they may want it to, mm. uh, that they like, that IP helps serve that purpose. And so for them, they don't see a conflict. The denial of access to any given thing is not an issue for them. It's certainly not a moral issue. Um, and so for me, because I want to see the increase of people's access, um, I, I believe that profits, while nice, are like a useful uh, tool to drive costs to zero if possible, um, or at least to get it as close to that as possible in the existing context. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that there should be uh, the full freedom to use any recipe for a medicine um, and so I would, I would only consider it theft if you, uh, say stole the actual, um, like physical pills mm -hmm. from, from somebody who, who, who needed them, um, not, not to reproduce the, the pill with your own materials. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're using your own materials then it just can't be considered theft unless it's music <laughs> <laughs> or like vis visible art you know like <laughs> mm. yeah i hear that i hear that 
I'm definitely uh, uh, on the on the anti copyright train right now. I don't know how it's panning out for me in terms of my own music, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, right. I'm curious, and and this is definitely important. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you please go. Interrupt me, please. Um, I just wanted to mention because I know we get into a lot of the cool economic stuff and the theories, but really we're talking about how to help people get access to, uh, say, estrogen hormones Mm -hmm. in in a uh, state where maybe it's illegal for them to openly pursue that. Um, We're talking about how to get, if this becomes an issue, uh, abortion pills to people in places where it's outlawed. Mm -hmm. And if those people are, for any reason, um, not able to pay the cost, or if we just want to give them that pill because we don't care about it uh, being compensated, we want to come up with ways to put this in their hands. Mm. And so, while it's you know it's it's cool to be like, oh, let's drive cost to zero, and then what if we had a perfect economy where nothing costs anything? <laughs> but really, we're talking about just making sure people who need certain medicines get them and don't have to pay for them or pay as little as possible. Because you would think with such a massive economy that we would be pretty good at driving the costs of medicines down. But because we have this whole fencing off dynamic, um, that's something that supports the legal oppression of marginalized groups. So capitalism is not, (laughs) it's not the only, like it's, it's two people hitting you from both sides you know there's the state on one side saying hey we don't want you to have this pill and then capitalism's like and it's not cheap even if you can get it Mm, yeah (laughs) and and at some point it might be too expensive even if it was legal um but if it's not then it's even harder so people who are interested in helping those groups need ways to circumvent those means of oppression yeah and what that's what four thieves vinegar is doing right Absolutely. And they're using this model of micro labs. And so when we talk about bringing the cost to zero, the way that we functionally achieve that is there is some investment going into the equipment, but then you are able to lower the production cost long term so significantly. And of course, you have no profit motive against yourself. So there's no like, I'm going to raise my own cost, you know, like you're just going to use it. And if your friend needs it, um, then you might just give it to them because you know they're in the same position as you. And that's really what a lot of this um, community-based activism is centered around, the idea that we mutually have these needs. We're all in a position based on our oppression that we have certain needs. And so why would we want to continue some smaller model of oppression against each other? Um, So the micro labs makes it so that Either you can make it yourself or it can be locally available. So maybe you and a, and a bunch of activists can get together, pool resources, produce these things, and then distribute them to yourselves and just fundraise for the costs and all chip in. Um, so that's one way yeah. that you can actually functionally do it. And that those instructions are available online. Um, there are a lot of groups online that are trying to make sure these things are available for people and so if you if people look there's definitely more than just the four thieves there's this other group um let's see if i can i can't remember their name right now but um they're doing abortion pills and helping people get access to them and so there's really a lot of different options uh depending on what it is you need and, uh, and that's because the resources necessary to make these drugs, the, the chemical precursors, the equipment, these are all available and used for many other things. So the law is really not able to functionally limit, at least to this point, um, people's access to the means of production of those medicines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's very much part of a... Of a, a a good trend that's, you know, you're seeing more distributed technologies. And so people can do these kinds of projects, um, you know, not just like seizing the means of production, but it kind of cascading over mm-hmm. the rest of us. And then we can use it to adapt. I um, part and, you know, I can only imagine that those kinds of technologies are also being used um, 
through for like mutual aid purposes. Um, and your fifth uh, topic, if you allow me a really obvious segue, is uh, mutual aid involving exchange of services and resources. Right. One of the things that I have uh, learned in my activism that almost feels really, really unintelligent to say out loud is this idea that the groups of people who are getting help have agency and capacity to help themselves and are just in some position circumstantially that requires some additional help. And so it's not that um, we should think of people as helpless that's really like a liberal narrative and it's really defeatist. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I realized that there's all these examples of groups sending each other things and one group might've needed one thing, but didn't need as much another, then those groups are able to assist and that it didn't seem like it was done in a transactional manner. So it didn't seem like it was, Hey, we're making sure we get our money's worth out of this deal. It was just a, a relationship of ongoing support back and forth. Um, And so I did see that between Vietnam and Cuba. And even though I'm not a tanky and uh, although I'm, I'm, I'm in a point in my studies where I'm questioning my understanding of those specific two countries. um, The more I look, the more I'm thinking there's some things I don't like, but it's not extreme. It's not the way, Maybe because I was Cuba, I was raised especially. Republic. I'm sorry. Go ahead. With Cuba, especially with the with the, um their micro farming and their cooperatives and stuff. Continue. You oh raised- yeah. Um. Yeah. Cuba's got a lot of interesting things going on, and I was raised Republican, so I can't trust anything that I learned for the first 18 so years of my life. Um. So basically, I'm in a position where I I uh, still suspect that I wouldn't want to um live all the time in these countries, but. I uh, I start to wonder: Are they that different from the the way that America is, and all the problems we have? You know, is is it a pretty uh, like almost elitist Western view to look down on other countries when we're America <laughs> and we have homelessness that is rampant in our cities? So how dare we think? Oh, those those Marxist. Uh, dogmatic authoritarians over there abandoning their people. <laughs> um, it's it's a weird position. So anyway, even though I'm not um, tied down to Cuba and Vietnam in terms of liking them and everything they do, uh, I think it's a pretty good example of of some friendship going on. And maybe you maybe you could say it's just a nationalist gesture or something. But there's other nations that did it, like the Irish and the Choctaw. And I don't think those were mm-hmm. gestures. Um, the Choctaw had just gotten to the end of the Trail of Tears. And that was a journey that, for anyone who's not exactly aware, was when American soldiers moved Choctaw people from where they had lived for um, however long, historically, uh, hundreds of years, if not longer, um, by foot. Uh, I believe it was several weeks or even months of walking. Uh, the small children and the elderly had to keep pace with the younger people, and that resulted in the death of many small children and elderly folks. Um, and so the Choctaw had just endured uh, a historically painful genocidal event in their people's history mm-hmm. and heard that the Irish were starving and turned around and donated them money. Mm. And the Irish were suffering, of course, from a imposed famine by the British, because even though the potatoes weren't doing so great in Ireland, the British had already taken all of the usable grazing land for the uh, cows. There was tons, literally tons, of meat being shipped out of Ireland to England Um, So Irish people were starving just because of English oppression. There wasn't not enough food. Um, And so the Choctaw recognized this and in like an incredibly early act of solidarity, uh, you know, there's no Facebook. You can't say this was like virtue signaling. They, they sent what little they had. Um, And, and so uh, more recently, the Irish have supported different indigenous nations Um, I believe it was with COVID vaccines and tests um, and different resources. And so there's definitely an ongoing relationship. And it shows that these different groups who have been at times in need are still able to help each other. 
And so we shouldn't look at mutual aid as, as basically as just a, a euphemism for charity. It's not. It's actually a relationship. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I always love hearing these stories about Ireland because they always have such a great solidarity with other nations mm-hmm. like Palestine and, you know, like you're saying, indigenous peoples. Um, I, I, I do think it's interesting the way you're talking about the sort of exchange that is mutual aid, but it's also, you know, it's not just, yeah, it's not charity. It's just giving and receiving and giving and receiving and giving and receiving. And so, you know, we've talked about mutual aid. Um, what about uh, your numbers, uh, the number six thing, which of your uh, healthcare access strategies, which is the use of mutual aid involving the lending of zero interest loans, another topic uh, close to heart for many mutualists to obtain capital. Uh, you particularly talk about Proudhon's Bank of the People, which is a really interesting concept, um, where, you know, quote, the moral need for the interest rate to be zero or for loans to be at cost of administration, so a nominal fee at most, uh, I really think strikes at the heart of some of the like mutualist concepts. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts on Proudhon's Bank of the People is oh, and thanks. or uh, was. Definitely. And, uh, and I'll definitely make sure I keep it, um, like I'll, I'll tie it back into healthcare too, because I know it sounds like it gets a little away from it, but we're talking about ways to acquire the resources. Um, cause, cause access means that you have to go through these physical practical steps of getting the stuff, getting the people. So, so I wanted to make sure that I was, you know, able to see exactly how that's possible. And since I had already previously wrote a piece about my idea for anarchists to apply the insights of um, a school of thought that supports zero interest loans, um, that's mm-hmm. like my my shtick in the anarchist world now is to convince <laughs> anarchists to abandon. Uh, this holdover Austrian theory that we've randomly inherited uh, from very questionable sources. And so um, so here it is. Proudhon, okay. 200 years ago, was talking about how we could abolish interest because it's immoral. It's not necessary. And if I'm not mistaken, was it Bastiat? Oh who was arguing for, it was another famous libertarian was thinker of the time. Um, yeah. And they had this really interesting debate about the morality of interest. And, and um, so Perdone's theory uh, argument was that if it ever was justified, which is possible, maybe in the past, maybe economically things weren't structured very well. And so if you gave someone a loan, um, you really needed to charge interest, uh, maybe even with the way that states worked. Um, it Maybe it was just not possible to, to do the zero loan, zero interest loan. But he said now, and this was 200 years ago, and he was looking at the affluence <laughs> surrounding him and saying nowadays – the, the wealthy country we live in, we should be more than capable of doing a zero interest loan. That's not even a big deal because we're not saying it's mm-hmm. a grant. You're getting the money back. So why yeah. should somebody else make money off of your labor? Because that's what you're getting the loan for. So basically, he was kind of like yeah. taking Marxist principles and just applying them financially and saying, if you're getting a loan so that you can start a business and you know build a factory and, and do work and then make a product and sell it to people and contribute to the economy like we all say is such a good thing, then why are we going to hinder people by charging them interest? Um, we just want to get the principal back. If we get the principal back, then mm-hmm. there's no loss and the economy gained a business. And so, yeah. so morally, he was saying, we don't have a justification any longer to charge interest. And I think that's one interesting um, argument for that. Yeah. I, I mean, music to my ears, especially the sort of like exploitation element of interest as being able to get, you know, uh, money for other people's labor uh, without, you know, yeah, you know, there's a reason why this is in your article about, you know, healthcare access. And I'd love to, you know, so what is the reason it's in about healthcare access? What can zero interest loans teach us right now about, you know, 
how to get access to our help. So basically, since we've reviewed that, you can either start from scratch and uh, build your whole own thing. You can steal someone else's. You can demand that they help you with theirs. You can copy the blueprint and then make your own. Um, or you can, you know, maybe trade with somebody who has it with something you have. Um, or this one is you can ask someone to either buy you the thing so they're not worried, like, what are you going to use the money for? Like, they could just buy it for you and then you owe them. Or they give you the money and you buy it um, as long as there's trust there. And and so it's another strategy that if you're trying to fundraise, if you're trying to figure out how do we do this, how do we build this, I think it adds to the toolbox. You have another way to say, okay, we want to get um, a loan from you. Uh, we would like it. I mean, we can include an additional fee. You know, we're not saying just principal. We could give, you know, the paperwork. You know, it takes time to process loans and stuff. Um, but if there's someone who's interested, just like in the past, the Panthers showed there's doctors who are willing to help people. Doctors have some money. Uh, <laughs> there's other medical staff. Uh, you go to all those different people and you ask for a zero interest loan. You're not saying you're asking for just free money. You're saying you're going to pay it back. Maybe even with, um, with inflation adjusted, you know, like you, you could add in whatever little negotiational things make it more um, palatable. But, but essentially, um, that's one thing you could do. Another thing is this uh, idea, I kind of went into it more in a different article, but the idea that you as the people can create, just like Prudhon said, the bank of the people, you can create your own bank of the people. Um, and that's because the same argument Proudhon was making about the morality of a zero interest loan. Uh, fast forward 200, late, 200 years later, and a school of thought called modern money theory, headed up by Warren Mosler and Stephanie Kelton, if you've ever heard of them. Uh, Stephanie was the, um, the campaign manager for Bernie Sanders. And, um, hmm. and so Warren's argument... And this is Chartalist. So this is started by uh, Jörg Friedrich Knapp. I think I said that right. Um, and Knapp said, law, um, the law determines what money is. The government says this paper is now usable to pay taxes. Because what does the government do? It comes in and says, you owe me taxes. How do you get the money? Oh, well, actually, we're hiring. You want to join the army? You want to build a road? You want to, uh, you know, work at the police station <laughs> um basically we're we're offering jobs and you do what we want and we pay you this money and if you don't want to work for us that's okay you can still be a farmer but you got to sell your food for our money because if you don't have our money at the end of the year something happens to you and i know in a western world context that really doesn't seem like the enforcement factor that it is because there's lots of people who probably don't file their taxes and nothing happens um but historically speaking there was something and mosler brings this up a lot which is how i know about it there was something called the hut tax and the germans the british the portuguese they would go to different um, countries like the natal colony of south africa or like uh, namibia and they would say look you owe us um a tax it could, you know, one country, I think it was 14 shillings. And if you don't pay it at the end of the year, we burn down your hut. So now all of a sudden, you have a non-zero need for their currency. You need their currency. So now they're offering jobs. You're willing to work for them. So libertarians really get this part wrong. They always say the government wants my taxes. They're, they want my money. No, they don't want your money. They don't need your money. <laughs> they want your labor. You had to show the receipts that you did enough labor for them by getting money. That's what money's purpose is. It doesn't need gold backing. It's not the faith and trust of the government. It's fear and intimidation. They will do something to you if you don't work for them. So every libertarian who did tax evasion, and I'm going to actually, my next piece is about this. Um, you already did the work for the money. So you didn't get over on the government. You did exactly what they wanted. You worked for them. They don't need the money. They just print it. Damn. 
so the so the the positive side of this that applies to healthcare is you and I could decide we are making a bank of the two people and we're going to charge ourselves weekly a 8 shilling or an 8 anarchy dollar tax and we're going to say we're paying 20 anarchy dollars to go um hang out with this uh this older person who needs some home health care you know like they need they need like a bath once a week and they need someone to, to help move them back and forth a little bit and and just you know do something with them for some p- small period of time periodically so so we don't know who wants to do that between the two of us but we institute a tax that we voluntarily submit ourselves to because we're anarchists it has to be voluntary and then um Say I say okay, I'll go do it this week. I I go to that uh, older person, hang out, help him out. Then our bank of the two people pays me my twenty anarchy dollars, and then I have the eight anarchy dollars I need for the week's tax. You don't. So maybe you, when I'm coming, when I'm at the guy's place and I want to ride home, maybe you come pick me up. And you facilitate me getting there and back. Maybe you do it both times. Maybe I give you the other 12 anarchy dollars. So now we both pay back our tax to the anarchy bank. It's in debt technically for anarchy dollars. It doesn't matter. We made them up. And what we really achieved is somebody got to that person and back and did what we agreed as this, as an organization what we wanted. So any number of anarchists, 20 anarchists, 50 anarchists, uh, a small community could decide we're going to impose upon ourselves the eight anarchy dollar weekly tax. We'll each uh, decide how we're going to get our eight anarchy dollars by the end of the week. And we're going to make the jobs that get paid anarchy dollars be healthcare. I mean, It's like music to my ears, what you're talking about right now. The really, like, that is the genius of the whole, um, you know, from Proudhon's bank to, uh, to like Tucker's free banking and mutual banking and things like that. And like, these sort of strategies are so interesting. Um, I'm curious, have you ever uh, looked, because this was my area of research was, was time banking as used to take care of elders have you looked? Have you heard of time banking? You know, a long time ago, when I looked into different um, versions of currency and economies, I did see some kind of labor notes based on time. And I think if it's an agreed upon um, service that that whoever is in this group that's doing the tax says, okay, we decide this amount of time is worth this much, um, that's perfectly legitimate. Um, there, mm-hmm. you you know. Uh, I'm sure the economic Austrian thinkers who, you know, who might be listening might think, well, there's, there's limits, there's, there's things you can't do. Well, sure. But for what we're trying to do, it would be a workable system. It doesn't have to perfectly mean that I can trade my, my time that I spent with, uh, with somebody for any given thing, because not everything is offered in every economy or for every currency, at least in theory. Um, and so, so you can't, you know, we can't have like an unrealistic demand of the system. We're just creating a system that does what we want it to do. And that's the standard that we evaluate it by. We don't evaluate it by, could this scale up for the whole world? Well, that's not what we're doing today, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Even though my work was pretty uh, that I looked into was time making, I think there's like a limit to that system. Like there's there's like different scales, like you're saying, of, of different projects that can happen. I'm really interested to hear. Um, so, I mean, obviously, being able to set up a bank for yourself is a great way to get access to yeah for zero interest loans for your project. What does can you do a bank of the people now? Do you think? Could you do something like that? Because I that's a, something I'm looking into right now is like roles that maybe credit unions could have in like facilitating something like new economic projects. I believe that you absolutely could because the only difference between any other bank organizing an economy and us is that we are coerced by the state to submit to the current yeah. system. And so so my big insight is what if without the coercion we submitted to an identical system that was 
just as power well identical in its structure but um you know with different values so it'd be just as potentially powerful like the the one for one is equal now if we had as many people as them we could do as much as them given uh that the resources you know cetera is paris like uh, all things equal stuff um and so so basically we and this is like an activist uh, principle that we already have everything we need to achieve what we want because we are the ones who make it. And so, with that understanding, um, it, it reframes the question into why aren't we just doing this when it's an available structure that we know it works because it's the one we submit to? We have to pay a tax and. Because of that, we have all this crazy stuff. Um, now, of course, if you got rid of the tax, people would still do things, but but it'd be a completely different structure in the economy. Um, you know, the, the influence of the capitalist state is just so massive that it's uh, even even those of us who are confident that we know what a decentralized economy would look like still still can't answer too many specific questions if it came to you know like x and y companies collapsing you know we can't even predict the fallout of, of a given bank you know how far will that knock the dominoes so i really hesitate to uh to make those sorts of predictions but i do think that we could um as long as we combined it with the tactics the panthers did where you actually go and talk to the doctors you go and talk to the staff um but you could even use this in a way that builds towards the future. So you could um, use this to help people go to school. Because I understand there's limits. If we're making our own alternative banking economy, there's going to be, from the start, some serious limits. Like we're going to be probably really good at things like daycare and really bad at things like um, fixing uh, a car if the car needs replacement parts. And so, so – we're going to have certain things in our capacity based on our starting position. Um, but that said, the ability to help a generation of people go to medical school because you're able to, you know, get them, get them resources they need, um, you know, back up their families, basically provide a community support network. Um, imagine if we even focused on one area or one group of you know, one city to, to try and push extra, uh, you know, graduates out in any given field um, by, by supporting families. I mean, you'd have to, I guess, predict what the kids wanted to go to school for beforehand. So maybe that's hard, but I'm sure if you did it on a wide enough scale, some people would come back <laughs> as doctors and, uh, and, you know, you could build a community culture. It's not about them being like indebted to the system, but you want to build a culture where we're actually helping each other achieve these goals and not viewing it as, as everyone's in their own separate structure. That's one of the things these groups did really well is when they went to people, they were in the community and they stayed in the community. And those groups who did leave um, lost the power almost immediately because the power is in the relationships. Um, the state often replaces those relationships and corporations do too. And so we build power when we rebuild those relationships. And one of the main struggles to rebuilding those relationships is the fact that as they're trying to do it, the state is constantly trying to supplant them, whether it's like barter tax, which is a big obstacle for some community currencies um, and community currency projects, or even just like straight up counterfeiting laws. <laughs> If they're trying to, uh, which is less of an issue, but you know, I'm very, I'm interested also to hear how you think it intersects with agorism because I feel like agorism really, especially in the sense of like creating and defending an alternative economy, would be really core to something like a modern bank of the people. And you're you're an agorist, definitely. Right? And um, and it's so funny that you mentioned this because I've been working on a piece that really analyzes agorism from an MMT perspective and really reframes it, kind of uh, eliminates the flack, the stuff that's not correct anymore, um, and emphasizes the stuff that was always correct about it. And so um, agorism definitely is really important because we we know that 
at the point when you start, when the state and corporations aren't helping you gain access, that it's really difficult. There's all these laws against, you know, doing medical procedures in a non-medically licensed location. Um, police uh, harass a lot of people like the, uh, the Jewish anarchists in Philadelphia. Um, they, they were facing a lot of harassment when they first started their different clinics and hospitals. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult equation to imagine there being like a security force standing up to the police, uh, defending some kind of clinics. But then again, we might end up seeing something, something approaching that, um, I wonder if there's going to be like certain neighborhoods just like now where the police just don't go. And those could definitely be places where people are able to access care they need. Um, and often, you know, some of the most oppressed places do, do end up creating these exact organizations we're talking about. And so, so their agency is not lacking just because they're, you know, in such a tough position. Now, in terms of agorism's prediction for growing, I actually criticize that because the state doesn't need the revenue from agorists uh, or anybody. And so, um, so the, the concept that Konkin wrote about of the state increasing its strangling of the economy and people increasingly turning away into the black market Cap capitalism has definitely caused people to do that, um, but I don't see it as an accelerating sort of problem where the state gets too Ooh. desperate and unstable from lack of funds. And as Konkin predicted, the army deserts because there's no pay. That can't happen. Um, and so uh, healthcare is going to still be a really vulnerable spot for activism since there's no uh, increasing tipping point, we can look forward to the state being less vicious or less capable. At. They're always going to be this capable until their dying breath, in my opinion. And I'll explain that uh, theoretically soon. <laughs> I totally hear that. I feel like agorism for me, you know, is it agorism? Or um, you know, I really don't mean to, to sound like I'm correcting you. I believe that the Greek is agora, and so the the ism is agorism. Um, although I definitely started out saying agorist, and I kind of like how it sounds that way. Um, <laughs> but I try to respect languages. Uh, I don't know who, who I'm getting points from with that. but <laughs> Yeah, I hear that. I feel like I've just seen it so much more red like on yeah. paper than i have said it out loud um mostly when i'm talking to people about you know agorism agorism uh it's in much less theoretical terms <laughs> um but i'm also really interested uh, what i was trying to say is before i got confused by language was that for me like agorism agorism is uh more of a strategy than it is like a great theoretical like model of history the way that Konkin sometimes presents it but it's a great way to talk about specific strategies of counter economics absolutely it uniquely identifies different markets distinguishes them i believe its class analysis is valid um and uh and yeah, so my sticking point is it's just based on gold standard economics and if you yeah. apply MMT to it it ends up it really changes it. That's yeah. And I'm excited to explain those changes soon. Um, cause there's there, and I've been thinking about this for over a year. Uh, I typically do when I write something, I've thought about it for too long and, uh, just needed to yeah. finally see what other people think about it. Well, I'm really excited to see that article because I almost got thrown off at first because I, I've done a lot of writing and reading on mutual banking from like the individual anarchists and, you know, the uh, time-based currencies with war and stuff. But I really have not looked into modern monetary theory much. And then when you phrase this like uh, idea, I was like, that sounds so familiar. And yet it's different. And I can't <laughs> try right. to adapt my brain. So I'm really interested to see uh, more of that. I'd actually um, would love at the end to ask about some books on modern monetary theory that perhaps uh, you could recommend to me and the listeners. 
Absolutely. But, MMT takes the moral issue that Proudhon brought up and puts it in a financial sense and says because the government is a monopoly issuer of currency, it cannot run out. And therefore, it is the sole source of money in the economy. All public debt is is surplus in the actual economy. And so for anyone to argue that there should be an interest rate is arguing that the government should unnecessarily remove resources from the economy that it's already put in, that people have already built up and invested on, and just take them back out. If we wanted to zero out the debt, that would mean there's no money to spend. So there has to be money in the economy. An interest rate is not a moral issue. It's just a completely not necessary. We don't need to collect the money back. Um, it just drives up the cost of doing things, which is what the loans are for. And so um, so it really just takes an accounting perspective and says, you only did you only do that because there used to be a gold standard. There isn't now. We don't need it anymore. Hmm. That's really interesting. I, I could talk for hours about this, but we've talked to, uh, we've reached the end of our six categories of strategies to access healthcare. Um, I'm curious to ask, are there any additional categories outside of the ones you list in the article that uh, of accessing healthcare strategies that you'd like um, to have? You know, it strikes me that there is a big one that I left out, and that's because I was focusing on, or I was at least trying to focus on anarchist strategies, or at least functional strategies anarchists would use. And basically, they all revolve around, like, you know, corporations fenced off healthcare. So you can either, uh, you know, sneak in, steal it, uh, you, you make your own, um, all those things we discussed. The Marxist answer is you unionize all the workers of the people inside the place and then get them to, or hope they agree, to make access available to everyone. Um, mm. And that's, you know, for what it's worth, I can say that I know healthcare workers in this country, I think they're uniquely vulnerable, uh, if that's the word, to uh to unionizing i think they're like recently there was this legal issue where a nurse made an error um the drug they gave a patient it was misspelled and so they gave a different drug um and they killed the patient and apparently this is something that a lot of nurses feel like even though it's a terrible outcome that's actually something that in the pace that they go at is possible uh, they all feel a lot of them felt like they really could have made that mistake themselves, and the um, the government tried to charge that nurse with uh, with murder, and um, and I think they they didn't get I don't think they were uh, convicted of it, but I felt at that time because of my awareness of my my wife is a nurse, um, it really seemed like nurses were gonna start going going. Uh, going a lot harder on the strikes because during COVID they started striking for better conditions. Um, so we've seen that even though we associate organizing and unionizing and striking uh, with Marxism, we've seen that's really what nurses have started doing at hospitals. And so if there was an effort to unionize them or if they had an effort to unionize that was greater, I think that could be a potential solution because the whole system really does rely on them. Um, so, so they could shut it down overnight if they wanted to, and they just don't because uh, they're really afraid of you know consequences, losing their job and stuff like that. They all got medical debt, or, or I mean, um, student loan debt from uh, from getting the the medical degrees, and so so that's one thing worth mentioning that organizing and unionizing could still be viable for this specific issue. Um, but that's not something that uh, is uniquely available to anarchists. So we can't necessarily, unless we just wanted all to become doctors and then fight for unions or something, uh, you know, we can't exactly do that overnight. Yeah. I'm a big union guy myself. I feel like I definitely lean towards uh, incorporating more worker power kind of concepts into market anarchism and such. Uh, and also, interestingly enough, 
the hospital down the street from where I live unionized, like last year. It was like a big, big thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm curious. So we're talking about like immediate things like, um, you know, unionizing and such. Uh, What are some other ongoing like healthcare alternatives happening right now? We've had a lot of historical context, but let's talk about Yeah. So now um, there's a lot of activism around the border. Uh, A few years ago, there were, and it's happening now still, but back when I was involved in it, there were thousands of people coming over the border and they had just journeyed from uh, Honduras, from Nicaragua, from El Salvador. Um, And they really, they were really like uh, a lot of people had colds. A lot of people just had, you know, some kind of illness or ailment or maybe a little small injury, some type of, uh, you know, foot thing going on. Um, And other people just had been walking for so long and maybe they had a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment scheduled that they, you know, had to just miss or, or needed some care. So there was a lot of people who came and needed some kind of care, especially after such a long journey. And there's so many groups helping those people in Phoenix, in all these cities along the border, um, and in Mexico too, Uh, especially in Tijuana. There are a lot of different activist groups, Mexican-based activist groups. Um, There's one Anarcha feminist group in Tijuana. Um, They have a, uh, a location that is really taking in a ton of people and giving them support, not just uh, medical support, but legal support. And so there's so many different groups that are like Cosecha, um, Border Angels, that are specifically helping migrants. And um, and it's really needed right now. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a group that they, there is, of course, agency among those groups. There is organizers who came with the caravan themselves. So uh, again, they're still making efforts to organize, but there's uh, a obvious difficulty with transporting resources and, and acquiring resources across multiple countries and thousands of miles, walking for 30 days mm-hmm. straight. Um, and so, so that's one big area. Another is um, here more in the States, is on Pine Ridge Reservation, there's a group called Mothers Against Meth Alliance, and that's Lakota women who are helping people on the reservation get access to resources to help their loved ones uh, to fight meth addiction, knowing where to go, what kind of signs, um, how to help. And so there's groups that are, just like I wrote about in the article, there was um, groups that were helping to fight the heroin epidemic, uh, White Lightning, And they called the heroin epidemic chemical fascism. Um, I've been, I took a look at the Mothers Against Meth Alliance uh, website and they have some propaganda calling the, uh, saying that the meth epidemic is a weapon of colonial genocide. So I think there's an interesting uh, similarity there that groups recognize uh, hard drugs are explicit, are specifically, capable of of oppression in in a way that uh, other things just don't achieve and so the resistance to that is uh is really really powerful um and then of course uh every year on march 6th uh, mothers against meth alliance has a black balloon day and you hang a black balloon outside your home and take a picture with the hashtag black balloon day to remember all those who have been lost to methamphetamines wow that's really powerful. I mean, you know, not only is the is it a form of oppression in and of itself, but the way also the ways that the state has been complicit in, you know, creating drug problems through drug wars and even like injecting drugs into particular communities. Absolutely. And there's um in light of the recent abortion um issues, it's it's worth pointing out anyone who's who's listening to this, who, who might like be concerned. There are ways to get the uh, abortion pill in states that are limiting abortion or restricting it. Um, you can go to justthepill.com. There is heyjane.com. Um, and 
those will uh, help you to acquire it. There's also different, um, in Europe, there's this company called Aid Access, and they'll ship to America. Um, and then for people who are in a different state, they can do something like mail forwarding from an address in a state where it's legal to get it. And so uh, there are a lot of activists working around abortion access. Um, and then there's, if you've heard of food not bombs, there's boobs not bombs. And they're helping people to get uh, a stradiol. So you can look up uh, instructions on their site. I will put all those the links to those things in the uh, bio of the podcast. Um, so I have one additional question based more on your own background. You've talked a little bit about how you've worked in Medicare and particularly working, you know, chatting with people. So I'm curious, what are some, uh, unmet needs that particularly, uh, anarchists ourselves can do to build power, uh, that aren't already being done, um, or that need to increase? One of the biggest things that I hear people talk about that they can't get on original Medicare and usually can't even get on Advantage. It's just like nobody wants to do this. It's home health aids. Um, And people will call in and say, hey, uh, it's not that I can't move around. It's not that I'm, you know, completely confined, but it's really hard to do certain things. Uh, There may be certain tasks that are, are far more difficult for them than others. And so... Um, The option to have somebody help them um, typically is only approved by Medicare if they're in a position where they really can't do anything for themselves. And there's a huge spectrum for a lot of different people with a lot of different conditions about what you can and can't do and when. You could have a good day and a bad day. Uh, You know, you could be strong one day and the next day you just can't do it. Um, and so I think it's just really unfair that there's a, such a strict medical requirement and, um, you know, it can include things no one, no one wants to do. Like people might need you to help them to go to the bathroom or they might not be able to bathe themselves and they need, Mm -hmm. they need that. Um, so honestly, if we're looking for ways to build community that, no one's going to say, hey, I don't want you to do that. I don't want that. Why aren't we thinking about helping our parents and our grandparents and our seniors who are no longer able to financially contribute to the economy but are still needing dignity? Um, another thing is medical yeah. transportation. If you're in a mobility device – and you have to call the ambulance, the ambulance isn't designed to fit your mobility device. So what happens is they take you to the hospital without it. They also do not pay for emergency ambulances to transport people back to their house because it's not an emergency anymore. I know that's like yeah. a ridiculous justification. You're like, well, it was. Well, yeah, of course. And and in any emergency, why would you need to go back to your house? Like, would you have the last pill in the country for your condition? Like, so, so there's no condition where it's able to get someone back from the hospital home. Um, you know, maybe asterisk that. Maybe there's some condition. But in most cases, most people can't. And so um, if, if anarchists are going to step up and say, hey, you need to go to the hospital and you don't want to pay $1,000 for the ambulance – what if we what if we help people and and of course it'd only be in situations where they didn't need the immediate ambulatory care so you know maybe that's limited but maybe we could also fundraise for an ambulance the Bla- the Black Panthers did it uh, they actually had ambulance service in one in one city not not every service that they did was in every single city um, but they did have an ambulance yeah. so that proves it's possible we can acquire it we can figure out how um, you know ambulances exist. So we can get our hands on one and use it and help or just people. A, a similar vehicle. <laughs> right, right. And and you'd need the staff specifically who can do the emergency immediate like EMT level care. Um, that's a little unique to their role. Um, and then, of course, there's things like daycare because people still need help getting to and from appointments and not having to bring their kids. Um and, and it's difficult, you know, people just 
put things off when they have kids and they don't have a feasible way to do things and then health declines. And when you're talking about an entire community, you know, the law of large numbers, you're going to have more negative health outcomes. You're going to have more social problems as a result of more people in the community going untreated for longer. And so when we as anarchists step up and say, Hey, we want supply to meet demand. We want to help you get to where you need to go. Um, And, and then if you need to come home, you know, there's someone to call. Because Uber's, you know, not reliable, and taxis are expensive, and ambulances are really expensive, and people don't know where to turn, and they call Medicare, and a lot of times Medicare says, sorry, that's not covered. That's it. Gotta call somewhere else for help. We don't have, we can't send you a ride. So, um, you know, I think that's a huge opportunity. Elder care, home health aides, people are dying for home health aides. So many people. And, you know, it might not be easy to find those people because you might need to go to like a senior center or, uh, you know, start hanging out with older folks more often and seeing who in the community needs more care and and what. But you got to, you know, put your name out there, start hanging out at some geriatric uh, places and, uh, you know, you got to make the relationships because that's what the power is. That's where the power is. And don't think for a second old people don't have smart political opinions because they tell them to me all the time they say hey i worked my whole life and i'm forced to receive this level of care i'm forced to pay the the premium that you charge every month and i have no accountability like you're not accountable to me at all that's ridiculous and i i just agree i just agree with them (laughs) because what am i going to say you shouldn't be entitled to what you're paying for that you're forced to pay for you know, we can, we can help fill those gaps. Absolutely. And as such, it, uh, you know, these are the communities where that are so right for these sort of like alternative funding systems that you, uh, that you're talking about. That was, you know, for me, time banks and, and particularly, you know, more theoretically mutual banking, but, you know, you're talking about modern, uh, monetary theory and the different schemes that could come up to like pay for things to happen in communities. Like these are the, spaces that begin with it by just meeting people's needs absolutely you got to prioritize the people not the politics because because then then they're all on board they don't care you know they're the young lords and panthers were marxists do we think that everyone they helped was no not at all especially a lot of older folks in their communities probably a lot of conservatives but you're offering help no one cares what you believe yeah and that's like that's the basis of it is, is, you know, whether it, whether it is counter economics or whether it is just sort of this like relational building is it's so much, not this big theoretical thing, but just what do you have? What do I have? How can I offer it? How can we negotiate voluntarily as opposed to giving into the shitty system? Right. And, and that's just a tiny mention of this other thing. That's how the young Lords had, if I didn't emphasize it enough, had the power to do those occupations. Because nowadays, a lot of activists have experience doing stuff where, you know, it was like a roadblock, you know, it was a, they shut down like an ice building. In the communities driving by, some people supportive, some people not. Um, you know, that's the nature of that resistance. But the young lords made sure the, the community told them what they wanted. So when they did something, the community was fully behind them. There was no, Mm -hmm. hey, they went too far. Oh, we don't agree with that. No, the community said that's exactly what we told them to do. They did it, and they're standing up for me. And we're not going to let you take take that away from us or them or or change anything about the narrative. We know what just happened here. Um, And so when you have the community's backing, it doesn't matter what your politics is. They asked you democratically what they wanted and you are able to meet their needs or try. Um, So that's the power. That's one huge takeaway is that you can really have the community's backing as long as you prioritize them. And that's something that's so missed in in all kinds of politics, whether it's libertarian or, you know, even uh, leftist politics, where it's uh, trying to bring these sort of big schemes in and less, but it needs to be approached more like, how, how can I get you what you need? Like that's, that's whatever uh, the, the people are going to be for is getting what they we, need. We get mad that uh, they, they, the state oppresses us and takes away our ability 
to do all these things. And we forget to do, just do those things, do those things. Yeah. And then, you know, face the state oppression, of course, but then you're actually doing the thing that you were upset. The state was taking away your ability to do. Um, so, you know, we, we need the revolution now. We need to do these things before the revolution if we can't have the revolution now. So we need to act now. Um, and that's, that's really like the thing is they were just like, what are we going to do now? And that's the hardest part. Every time any activist thinks like, oh, I'm actually going to do something. What am I going to do? That is the hard part is getting up and going to do something and not getting paid and, <laughs> you know, just fighting for what you believe in and and if you're not actively doing it then all the intellectualizing is is going to be like a waste of time Mm -hmm. yeah i hear that well this has been uh really great um i was a little off my game i I must admit because uh you know late start uh (laughs) late start false start but you know, I, I thought this was a really interesting conversation. I'm, I'm curious, is there anything that you'd like to chat about that we haven't There is uh, an interesting, there's three trends that I see that I think will unite in the future. Um, and, uh, and it'll, it could be good or bad. Um, and so these, these trends are, uh, medical tourism. Um, the next one is, remote outsourcing so one example is when construction companies have someone who knows how to operate the machinery in another country uh, connected by the internet to the machinery and so they're able to do multiple jobs around the world in the same day um, from one location Um, so so remote uh, outsourcing is one the other one that i said and then the final one is oh surgical robotics and so I think what we're going to see, because there's already medical tourism that kind of goes along mm-hmm. with, uh, with people needing to, to go elsewhere um, to the black market uh, for their services. And so when these three trends combine, people will be able to get surgeries from any physician in the world because there's a center that has the surgical robot in their town or city. And there's there's going to be a competition between domestic medical staff uh at least med- domestic surgeons and doctors and uh foreign surgeons and doctors um in other countries surgeries cost a third of the price they do here um and so if the robotics and the advantage of the robotics is that they make smaller cuts, they actually can use cameras in locations that allow views that give the surgeon a far better perspective of what they're doing. So they can not only see better, they can make smaller cuts. Patients have quicker recovery times and less risk of complications because the cuts are, are really small. Um, and so the issue right now is cost. The robotics is not cost competitive with surgery in the United States, but elsewhere in the world, I believe in India, I was researching, uh, surgical robotics are um, almost as cheap as surgery and compared to surgery here, they're a third of the price. And so once we have a way for uh, a surgeon in India, who's just as qualified as a surgeon in America, but charging a third of the price to do the same life-saving surgery uh, using a robot that's better than human hands um, in the States, people are going to be getting more affordable, or at least if if we uh, keep capitalism's grubby hands off of it, people will be able to get more mm. affordable services with less waiting time. Um, and there will be a, a almost like a competition around the world of doctors. I think that will negatively impact the American output of medical graduates uh, because there will no longer be a financial justification for the amount of debt. So either the years of schooling will have to decrease or the cost will have to. And it's difficult to imagine those educational institutions lowering their charges um, just because the medical industry is changing. Uh, And so I really do see people having greater access or what's going to happen is 
the the healthcare companies will just completely control all of those machines. They'll they'll uh, hire all the doctors from around the world and pay them, you know, whatever wage just barely keeps them working without, uh, you know, helping. And uh, and it'll basically cre- recreate the system we have now. Um, and so. So that's one possibility is it could go negative or positive, but I believe the future will be doctors from anywhere in the world doing surgeries on people who are also anywhere else in the world um, with those surgical robots. And, uh, and maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on if we get universal health care and what form universal health care possibly takes. It ultimately comes down to that which is the reason I, I, I'm with you of, of having some interest in Marxism is this sort of question of who owns it, who owns the means of production, who's controlling it. And so, so much of that has to do with the state and will have such a mediating outcome, um, a mediating role in deciding what outcome, whether it's the, we just have the same system again, or something like a truly interesting and competitive and global you know, maybe post-capitalist right. economy, and and that is possibly the future of of uh, universal healthcare in this country. I think is it, it could just end up being uh, basically another iteration of what happened uh, when the healthcare marketplace was created under Obama. Mm. Gotcha. So just more power to those corporations. They'll they'll basically create a system where everyone's insured, but you're still in an HMO or PPO. They still decide if and when you can get what services. There will still be co-pays. There will be better plans and not as good plans. Uh, you know, So everything that's bad about the private healthcare system now, they will just scale up to everybody um, because that's the only political feasible politically feasible solution America is interested in. When we talk about healthcare expansion, the healthcare companies that finance all the campaigns say, okay, how are you including us in this? How do we still make money on this? Because at no point are we going to not make more money on a change. Yeah. Because God forbid. (laughs) Yeah. We're Uh, not making enough. (laughs) Well, I would love to talk with you longer. I really would, but I'm running out of time on this free trial software. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I would love to chat with you again sometime. Very interesting. Lots of things that I hadn't considered before. Um, but, you know, for other people who listened and thought that this was interesting, what are some ways that they could uh, find your work? Um, my writing, uh, I always put with C4SS. Um, my, uh, my Instagram, as you mentioned, rage.incarnate. Uh, is a good way for people to keep up with me uh, professionally and personally. Um, and then links to my music are on there. And uh, and so that's basically uh, the best ways to keep up with me. Oh, yeah. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for coming on the Arrangé. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Eric.